pretty much I smoke and vape for a living. We've just put a GPS tracking device in the turtle nest. They're bigger than Barney and the Wiggles in my house. Saudi Arabia's top prosecutor is seeking the death penalty for five suspects that it says both carried out and ordered the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi without the Crown Prince's knowledge. But he didn't name the suspects, or six more who've been indicted, or 10 others in custody. So it's unclear if the group includes the 17 men that the U.S. Treasury sanctioned today. Facebook says it's cut ties with Definers Public Affairs, a consulting firm founded by ex-Republican campaign strategists, after yesterday's New York Times report alleging the social network engaged the firm to silence critics. On a call with reporters, CEO Mark Zuckerberg denied any knowledge of hiring the firm. I um, was, was not in the loop on a bunch of these decisions, and I should have been clear that, um, you know, I think that the team has made a bunch of these decisions, and I think Cheryl was, was also not involved. She learned about this at the same time that I did. Democrat Jared Golden won Maine's 2nd Congressional District. After the first use of ranked choice voting in a federal election, Golden finished behind the incumbent, Republican Bruce Poliquin, in a four-way race. But because Poliquin didn't crack 50%, the third and fourth place finishers were knocked out, and everyone who voted for them had their second choice counted today, putting Golden just over the line. I believe with every fiber of my being that the course I have set out is the right one for our country and all our people. British Prime Minister Theresa May defended her draft Brexit deal after seven members of her own party resigned in protest. Adding to the pressure on May, as many as a dozen Conservative members of Parliament are calling for a vote of no confidence in her leadership. Today, the FDA proposed a rule that anyone buying sweet-flavored nicotine for an e-cigarette submit to more stringent age verification. The announcement was a long time coming, and vaping giant Juul Labs tried to get ahead of it on Tuesday by announcing that it would temporarily stop selling flavored pods for its devices at retail stores, and that it would require online buyers to provide proof of age. But no amount of clamping down by the industry or the FDA, will stop this. I have my, kind of like my own style. I do like old school tricks, like what they start off with. Gotcha. So I'm doing like slaps and then bends. That's what I'm working on. This is Dash Drips. He's a 17 year old vape influencer who has more than 7,000 followers on Instagram, where he posts videos like this daily. He's even sponsored by small vape manufacturers, even though he's not old enough to vape legally. Who are some of your sponsors? Apple Drippers, Cloud Nerds, Plus Pods. No. It seems like there's a whole ecosystem of like oh, vape companies it's on so, Instagram. It's, it's everything. Like, it's kind of like you promote their product and you get a discount. We reached out to some of Dash's sponsors for comment, and only Cloud Nerds replied. It said that they were unaware Dash was 17 and that they don't support underage nicotine consumption. So how do you like get your fans? Hashtags, Hashtags. and then clickbait. Then as soon as I post, they'll comment and then they'll just like help the video grow. Right. And then I'll get more people, more people. Are some of the people that comment on your videos underage? Yeah, most of them. Did you smoke cigarettes before you vaped? No. No. I just found it tasted good. Yeah. So I just got into tricking after that somehow. What was the first flavor you tried? I think it was watermelon or strawberry. It was really good. Since Dash is too young to buy his own vapes, his mom buys them for him. When did you first find out about Dash vaping? I think he was like 15. What was your first thought? Um, I was kind of shocked. Then he came out and told me that he had started doing it when he was 12 and he was hiding it from me. How did you feel once he started tricking? Um, I was okay with it. Why is that? I don't think it's bad. I really don't, you know. Do you think you could start making money off of it? Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're kind of working towards now, mm -hmm. talking about, you know, with different sponsors, so. Mm. Jewel has transformed the e-cigarette landscape in just a couple years, 
It's now worth $15 billion and controls 70% of the market. In other words, it has a lot to lose. So ahead of the FDA's ruling, Juul moved to appease regulators, not just with the pods on flavors, but also by deleting its Facebook and Instagram accounts. So it wouldn't be seen as marketing to kids. The problem is, there are already thousands of young vape evangelists on YouTube and Instagram doing the company's work for them. Here's what we got. We got a Jewel Starter kit right here, which apparently now comes with mango. Donnie Smokes has been posting vape videos since he was 19. Pretty much, I smoke and vape for a living. How do you do that? <clears throat> I have a social media presence where I post up on Instagram or YouTube or Snapchat and I contact different companies and we work out deals. It's better to promote on YouTube for them or on social media because that's where their buyers are. How much money are you making? I could make anywhere from a couple thousand bucks to more than a couple thousand bucks a month. Yeah, the watermelon looks like that. By the way, I wanna say thank you to the Vape Guy Shop for hooking it up. With the growth that I was having on my original channel before it was taken down, I mean, it was insane. I mean, these videos were getting hundreds of thousands of views. Why'd you get taken down the first time? There were a couple specific videos that were like, Jewel Challenge. I believe it was the challenge part of it where they thought I was telling people to go out and try to do this, whatever. What is the Jewel Challenge? The Jewel Challenge was to see how many times I could hit the Jewel in a row. Yeah, you know, it's like- Without <laughs> passing out or? Hold it all in. Oh, oh, uh, without exhaling. Without exhaling, yeah, okay. After YouTube removed his account, Donnie re-emerged on the site, and his following came right back. Jewel doesn't sponsor any of these influencers. They get their money from companies that make third-party Jewel pods, other vape juices, or bigger vape rigs. Who is watching your videos? The largest portion of my demographic is people 18 to 25. Do you think people under 18 watch your videos? I think that it's possible that people under 18 watch my videos. You know, it's on the internet um, and people can find whatever they want to, so. Do you think they might come after vape influencers like you? Um, I mean, I'm just someone who's enjoying the products and testing them out, so I well, really- But you're being paid to promote them. That is correct. Um, is it gonna fall back on me? No, it's probably gonna fall back on these companies who are the billions and billions of dollars of revenue that the government cares about. Jewels have been incredibly easy to get and incredibly easy to hide. And that's what made them a hit among high schoolers. Kids can hit the jewel in class without their teacher noticing and school administrators have been begging for a solution. David Fleischman is the superintendent of Newton County Public Schools in Massachusetts. We are now at the elementary level adding vaping and e-cigarettes to our anti-tobacco units. In elementary school? In elementary school. The other sad part about this is the statistics on teen smoking is going way, way down across all demographics. And I feel like this is halting all that progress. The fact that it spread so quickly, Julie, without the FDA involved, to me, was dropping the ball. Now that the FDA has weighed in, though, the vape lobby is making a new argument about the restrictions in public health. So I've told my dog, Bibi, that this treat is a cigarette. Let's see if he reacts. Bibi, it's a cigarette. Bibi, it's vapor. Good job. If only regulators could figure it out. Jeff Steyer is a senior fellow at the Consumer Choice Center, a pro-vape think tank. What will the impact be of me only being able to buy jewel pods from vape stores versus a gas station? Well, imagine the typical consumer of an e-cigarette. There are a lot of adult smokers who like those sweet flavors and easy to use products. Those smokers have been going to convenience stores for 40, 50 years to buy their cigarettes. By removing e-cigarettes from convenience stores, these people were only giving them one more excuse not to quit smoking. And that is terrible for public health. According to data provided to Vice News by the CDC, there are more than 2 million e-cig users under 18 as of 2017, and almost 7 million adult e-cig users. Since 2011, the use of e-cigs by minors has exploded. So your argument seems to be that in a rush to stop kids from vaping, it actually blocked a lot of 
adult smokers who need these products in order to quit smoking. The whole point of e-cigarettes is for adult smokers. That's why they were created. E-cigarettes are 95% less harmful than cigarettes. That's because there's no combustion. The FDA has lost sight of the real problem, smoking, and is now attacking a product which is actually helping adult smokers quit. It makes no sense. We should focus on adult smoking and youth smoking, and we should prevent youth vaping to the extent possible, and we will have done our public health job. This is unlike any other public health issue, uh, other than condom use, clean needle exchange, and any other area where we do harm reduction. It is exactly like those issues because it is a product that is not entirely safe, but it can save lives in a way that other attempts to deal with those issues have never been able to do. Do you think a kid vaping just on its own in isolation is a bad thing for them? It may be that a kid vapes, becomes addicted to nicotine, and that kid decides that he wants to smoke. That could happen. I do not believe it is an epidemic. I believe it is teenagers being teenagers, experimenting with risky products. That's going to happen regardless of the regulation. Juul has always maintained that its product is a smoking cessation tool for adults and doesn't want the public to see it as a fast-growing youth brand. But Donnie and Dash have no plans to stop posting. Ew. So you feel like vaping and social media kind of goes hand in hand? Yeah. That's where the younger people of this generation are. President Trump spent part of his morning, as he usually does, attacking the special counsel investigation on Twitter. Apparently, the investigation is not just a witch hunt, but a total witch hunt like no other in American history. This in a country where witches actually did get hunted down and killed, but okay. It's tweets and comments like that that have members of Congress talking about protecting Bob Mueller's job. This bill is designed to do one thing, protect the integrity of the special counsel's investigation and spare it of any influence and interference from the executive branch. The bill Senator Jeff Flake was referring to is one he and Senator Chris Coons have been pushing since April, the Special Counsel Independence and Integrity Act. It would officially block President Trump from firing a special counsel directly, codify that the special counsel could only be fired for cause, and create a system for the special counsel to appeal being fired. The bill made it out of committee earlier this year with multiple Republican backers, and has basically sat in limbo, waiting for something to happen. Senator Coons says something's happened. I appreciate that there are many uh, colleagues, uh, mostly in the other party, who have said there's nothing to worry about here. We need to realize that just a week ago, um, the president compelled the resignation of his attorney general, his closest ally in the early stages of his campaign. And the reason he fired special, excuse me, fired attorney general Jeff Sessions was because he'd recused himself. Yesterday, Coons and Flake tried a procedural maneuver to bring the bill to the floor. McConnell shut that down real fast. Is there objection? Yeah. Majority Leader, objection. objection is heard. So now there are a couple of ways this could go if members of Congress actually want to try to curb one of Trump's worst instincts. The first relies on Jeff Flake's unique position of being a guy on his way out while still having a seat on the Judiciary Committee. I have committed not to advance uh, any more nominees through the Judiciary Committee. We've had hearings for um, 21. Uh, they're awaiting action, uh, some of them tomorrow and uh, they will not receive my vote. And uh, with the margins we have in the Judiciary Committee, it means that they will not move forward. This move strikes at the heart of Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's goals in this congressional term, getting as many conservative-leaning judicial nominees on the bench as possible. However, Flake has sung the tune of being the guy who will stand up to Trump before and back down. Exhibit A, Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. But Flake says this time's different. I've used this leverage once with regard to judges it was to receive a vote on tariffs, which we did. Um, and I didn't vote on any until we received that vote. I'm fully prepared to carry through with this. The committee tabled today's nomination, so we have to wait a little bit longer to see if Flake actually does live up to his promise. But there's another avenue for protecting Mueller, using the power of the purse. A good chunk of government funding runs out in December. Senators could say that without some kind of protection for Mueller and the funding bill, they won't vote to fund the government. And some of them seem somewhat interested in doing that. 
do you think it should be tied to the appropriations process? I support legislation that protects Mueller, uh, whether it makes it into the appropriations bill, which is being discussed, or some other way. What I said is we should use every opportunity we have, and we should definitely do that. So not necessarily right now with the appropriations that have to be I, done? Uh, I would say put it in those discussions. Are you willing to shut down the government over wanting to protect you know, Mueller's that, investigation? If anyone hasn't noticed right now, um, uh, in the last year, we don't run the Senate or the House at this moment. Um, and so that is going to be the on the Republicans. To to They're going to have to make a decision how they do this. As Senator Klobuchar's wishy-washy answer shows, shutting down the government is traditionally bad politics. And in the case of Jeff Flake, so is being the guy stopping judicial nominees from getting voted on right before you take leave of the Senate. Another option is to do nothing and wait to see if Mueller gets fired before he's finished the investigation, at which point it would probably be too late for Congress to do anything. So that could set up a choice for Democrats, bad politics or a bad outcome. Pig, 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 pig. Come on, pigs. In 2016, the U.S. government announced a competition for tech-based ideas that could expose and stop the illegal trade in animal parts. Kim Williams Guillen lives on her pig farm in Detroit. But she's an ecologist with NGO Paso Pacifico, which specializes in turtle conservation. She had one of the winning ideas. Oh, you're, oh are you going to help? Here's the transmitter. And obviously it's quite a bit bigger than the egg. These 3D printed eggs look almost like a turtle's, but they're GPS enabled, so the egg can be traced if it leaves the nest. We have two little ports, one so that you can charge it, and the other is the SIM card slot. Kim's device was part of an extensive field trial in Costa Rica, where many turtle populations are endangered or in decline. That's partly because their eggs are a popular bar snack. And outside of a small legal trade, they're sourced and sold illegally by poachers. <laughs> Helen Feezy was in charge of testing the fake eggs. So people steal turtle eggs in Costa Rica. Yeah. Why? Honestly, the driving force is crack cocaine. 12 leatherback eggs will sell for maybe $4, and that will buy you two rocks of crack. So what we're actually trying to do is understand trade routes for where poachers are taking turtle nests. Eggs end up in markets, but there's a gap in our knowledge. Like, are there major transport routes, or the transit hubs, or the places that eggs are being exchanged? At some point, you have to assume that these poachers are going to catch on, <laughs> right? So, wouldn't you? so, they catch on so what care, happens though. then? Do they catch on and do they care? Because if there's no, at the moment, there's no enforcement, and there's no concern, like there's no penalty for having one of these eggs. Do you think that your project is being successful? Yes. We've just put a GPS tracking device in the turtle nest. It traveled 155 kilometers. <laughs> it's really exciting. Yeah, because yeah, it's just like, this is working. This is legitimately working. Like, we've got an egg, leave the beach and go to a place like that's this, this, the handover point. And then the next day, I can pinpoint the exact house that it's in. Do you think that people will get arrested because of your work? Not directly from this field trial, absolutely not. But the idea is to actually have this as a law enforcement tool of the future and test the feasibility of doing that. Oh, this is and kind of squishy. Squishy, yeah, it feels like a turtle egg. Because that's the main thing that matters. If you're in the dark and you're mm -hmm. like just grabbing them out as quickly as possible, if you feel something that's like really solid or really cold or different, you're going to notice. But before she could deploy the eggs, they had to be charged and painted. I've sealed it up already, but that's where the um, SIM card goes in. It certainly looks very professional. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. We're going to hope for turtles. With the eggs prepped, Helen and her assistant, Angel Hernandez, go to the beach and wait for a female to emerge from the water. Their goal is to collect information about how the black market for eggs works. Let's go. I saw something right down there, but I don't know that it was necessarily a track. <laughs> you see it too, right? 
One hour into the patrol, Helen spotted a female. <laughs> Something to be said for 150 million years of evolution. Eh? <laughs> okay, let's sit back a bit and just go and wait over there and just let her, let her finish doing her thing, yeah. Hours later, the turtle finally found a nesting spot. She's using her back flippers, like hands, literally like hands. She's carving like the perfect shaped egg chamber and then just flicking the sand like that. What she should do is put both her flippers on the surface of the sand um, and then we should be able to see the eggs actually dropping into the egg chamber. And when she's laid 45, that's when I'm going to put the egg in. One thing Helen's learned is that when it comes to tricking poachers, the placement of the egg is crucial. Too low in the nest and the egg might never get taken. Too high and predators might get it first. The egg is on. 38. Okay, let's get organized then. 45. That's 45, okay, so I'm just gonna put this inside now. So, how many eggs did she lay? She actually only laid 62. Yeah, just give her some she's space. Just and she's going to go back to the water. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is this cool for you? Me? Yeah. I, this is what I get out of bed for every night. Cal, I'm Maddie, and I'm Johnny, and, and we're, we're the Beat Buds. Matt Shapiro and Jonathan Jonah have been best friends and making music together since they were first graders. They spent years in a moderately successful rock band, but after having kids, they started the Beat Buds. Beat Buds, hello, take one. Ha ha. Hello, Beat Buddies, and to the moms and dads, hello to the nannies, hello. When you describe what it is you do to other people, what do you say? Uh, I think I just start with I'm a, you know, I'm a performer, and what we we own a children's music company that uh, that brings birthday parties and in-home classes and, and does special events, and we have a pretty decent regional following here, where it's getting to the point where we don't people kind of know. The Beat Buds write catchy songs about brushing your teeth and taking out the trash. They have almost no internet following, and by now you're probably asking why we're even talking to them. Cut. Geography has something to do with it. Come on over, everybody. Let's play some music together. Yeah. We're the Beat Buds. The Beat Buds is the kind of project that can only happen in L.A. And they're a pretty big deal in the L.A. birthday party circuit. They play up to 120 gigs a month. Some of those gigs are for the kids of famous people. And at one of them, they got signed by Scooter Braun. The same Scooter Braun who manages Justin Bieber, Ariana Grande, and Kanye West. It's like Colonel Parker signing the Wiggles. You obviously work with so many huge artists. Why spend your time on a kid's act with like sub 500 YouTube subscribers? There's a couple reasons. One, I think it's potential to be a really big business. They had never focused their, their music or their brand online, but what they did with grassroots within Los Angeles and the areas around Los Angeles was pretty amazing. They built a pretty substantial business. You know, I used to say, if you can find an act and they're playing in a club in a small city and that club's going crazy, then you should be able to recreate that everywhere else around the country. The second reason is I love my kids. So as a person, it's clear to me that this is something that you're passionate about. As a business person, how confident are you that they'll succeed? I'm confident enough that I put up my own money. You know, I didn't just sign these guys. I bought into the brand. I'm their partner. Kids music is one of the least lucrative genres on the market. Since 2010, TV networks like Nickelodeon and the Disney Channel have lost over half of their audiences. Daddy finger, daddy finger, where are you? And the most popular kids' content on YouTube are nursery rhyme videos that go viral with adults for their bizarre animations and characters. Eating ha, ha, ha. Still, the Beat Buds are hoping to expand their business with their SB Projects partnership. Uh, 
which gives them access to Scooter's team of pop culture architects to develop, market, and produce their videos and live events. When a guy like Scooter comes along and we know Scooter's reach, uh, it's something you definitely have to take a look at. It, it gets our reach out further in terms of the different elements that we envision for this brand. I mean, we see it as this kind of multimedia approach where we got birthday parties happening, we got a possible television angle, um, there's a, a touring entity possibly. Just all the things that we've seen over time that could come to fruition, we believe that SBP can facilitate those, uh, those different angles. As a business investment, the Beat Buds are a rare music act with the economic upside of a smashed Disney franchise and no danger of the downsides of adult fame unlike the rest of Scooter's roster. And as Johnny and Maddie add more musicians to the team, there are fewer limits on how broadly they can scale. The first step in their pursuit of global domination is a supersized version of their backyard show called the Beat Bash. It's basically Coachella for babies. Why do your kids like the Beat Buds? Just it's, they're really catchy tunes and that's what I want to expose them to rather than any other type of music, right? Do you love the Beat Buds? Yay! What do you think the Beat Buds should do from here? We should take it on the road. Yeah. I would take this thing on the road. My biggest time of the year for me. You guys drink with me? There's a drink tonight? That's hysterical. All right, let's go out there and get ready for them. Ladies and gentlemen, please make some noise for the Beat Buds! Do you expect the Beat Buds to be as big as like a Barney or the Wiggles? They're bigger than Barney and the Wiggles in my house. Okay. Like, I've had some of the biggest musicians stay at my home, come over to my house. My kids don't care. But if the Beat Buds walk in, it's like Beatlemania. Yeah. <laughs> like they lose their minds. You know, it, when you ask me, are they gonna be as big? I would love to see that happen. And the reason why I'm fine with it is they're both good people. They just want to make kids happy. Right here, if you look straight, is a raft. Hola, buenos días. Por qué vienes a hacer Estados Unidos? Por darle un futuro mejor a mi hijo y ya no sea maltratado. We're with the caravan of migrants. They're people for as far as the eye can see. Nuestra vida corre peligro y no podemos volver. Nosotros no somos gentes, eh, como dicen sin vergüenza, somos gente luchonas. <laughs> 